Right, welcome to today's webinar. This is the third in the uh, Tidal Power Express event series. So uh, I'm Simon Cheeseman. I'm the Wave and Tidal Energy Sector Specialist from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Uh, the Catapult is the UK's leading tidal innovation and research centre for offshore renewables. And I'm Lorna Bennett, Project Engineer working with Simon at ORE Catapult, and I have a long history of working on marine energy projects across the UK. Great, thanks Lorna. Um, today's company is one of the sector's outstanding success stories. It's Simac Atlantis, and here to tell us more about uh, the company are a couple of members of the leadership team, uh, Drew Braxland and Philip Archer. And uh, just to make a note that um, this session is being recorded. Um, welcome, Drew and Philip. Um, please could you introduce yourselves and your roles at Simac Atlantis for the audience? Yeah, I'm Drew Blackstone. I think most people know me. I've been in the industry a fair time um, with a number of roles in the business since joining in 2007 as a consultant. Um, and I currently, for the last uh, chunk of time, been the director of uh, turbines and engineering services division, effectively the goods and services side of the business in uh, marine energy. Hi, I'm Phil Archer. Um, I've been working for Lancet for about 10 years now. Um, my role is the head of product application. Um, so what I do in my role is uh, look to optimize the turbine design um, for specific site conditions, uh, for load reduction, reduced cost of energy. Uh, also do some load calculations, um, site studies, uh, and some project direction as well, uh, in particular the, the recent Japan project. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I should say that uh, both Drew and Philip work with me um, in, with my Cornwall um, office team. Um, as part of the TIGER project, that's the Tidal Industry Energizer project, which is a uh, interreg part funded project looking at uh, cost reduction for tidal stream. Um, so we'll get into more detail a little bit later about that. Um, but just for the viewers who don't know um, Simon Atlantis's sort of company history, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it all started? Yeah, I'll give you the, the quick pitch. It's a, it's a long and arduous story uh, with many interesting chapters, uh, if it was a book. Um, but I like, I like the story as a nutshell. We started literally in a little hippie village in the north coast of New South Wales in Australia, uh, where you know, the first sea capital was raised with a one kilowatt turbine being um, pushed through the water by a boat. Now, lit up a panel that says invest here, and that's how the, the company started. Um, and you fast forward from that to Morgan Stanley's involvement with the business, which is our first injection of big capital. And I think, you know, for us as a, as a journey and you break it down to its parts, certainly when Tim and I were started the business, it was always focused on the development of an, in, an industry providing um, the development of tidal arrays. We probably became reluctant technologists a little bit in some respects, although very interested in the technology, lots of money spent on patents, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't until we sort of started the journey a few years in and realised that actually in terms of being able to go out there as just a developer and buy a commodity that was on the street, it didn't exist. Still doesn't quite exist, but it's come a long way. And so we, we fell into then being master of our own destiny from the technology. And that's when I took that part of the business in terms of the, the, the turbines itself. Um, we moved to Singapore and, and that was a good move and ultimately the UK. And then I think pivotal to that story and really reinforcing the two parts of the business, the developer and the technologist, we bought MCT in 2014, who had been a very technology-focused business, and that brought a lot of great assets to people, the experience with them, and it was great to actually bring sort of two competitors together at that point in time, and that helped make a success of the turbine you see behind me, the AF1500, in terms of getting a turbine in the water that, uh, that not only was going to be great infrastructure, but also work. Uh, fast forward to where we are today, we've, you know, we've become a public business public company um, and that's got all the ups and downs that come with being a public business but here we are still 20 years later. That's excellent thanks for such a detailed overview Drew and um, just a quick reminder to anyone joining us live today you can start adding your questions to the Q&A um, for, uh, for the company here and we'll try and answer as many as we can just now if we don't get to any today then we will definitely circulate them to the guys here and uh, email out those answers with the link to the, the session afterwards. Brilliant, thanks very much Lorna. Um, let's move on and talk about the technology then. Um, let's start with a look at your latest turbine model and find out a little bit more about how it works and the types of locations you're currently deploying to. 
Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll kick this off and then certainly hand over to Phil for a lot of detail. Um, that is the AR1500. You see there, it's effectively any AR series turbine. They're not going to look a hell of a lot different depending on uh, the, the rating and the rotor size. That You won't be able to distinguish an AR3000 from an AR1500 much at all in terms of the overall um, turbine itself. But that AR series turbine is a subsea founded turbine. It's uh, gravity based. Um, so in other words, the white part just sits under its own weight to the uh, to the yellow part to the foundation, um, and it, you know it, it's uh, it's basically the cornerstone our cornerstone subsea marine energy product. So what is it that makes this design unique? Yeah, there's a lot of things, and uh, I'll give the headlines, and then Phil, you might want to pick up on some of the detail. But it's a it's a monocoque design. Anyone who knows vehicle design, you have a monocoque chassis where your, your bits and pieces are actually also your chassis or you actually build a separate chassis like a wind turbine and shoehorn all your bits and pieces inside. And that's that's probably the main difference between our, our turbine and the Hammerfest turbine that are both at Manchin, is when you look at that turbine, the gearbox, the generator, which are towards the aft, all of that is actually the structural component of the turbine itself. So you're not building a submarine and putting something inside it. It's, all, it's, it's basically a monocoque design. On top of that, um, and this may sound insignificant, but for people who are putting turbines off and onto ships, it is almost the same level in air as it is in water. That is something that drove the engineers crazy, that, that mandate that, uh, that Dave and I set back in the day. And uh, it, it was for a good reason, is that being able to lift that turbine simply out of, a, out of its frame onto a deck of a ship and put it subsea without having to fiddle around with rigging and whatever else it's uh, proved a uh, hugely smart thing to do. Um, on top of that, uh, it's it's got a wet mate system. It's not quite shown correct in that picture because the turbine's in um, in a yaw position, but the wet mate system effectively allows you to take the, the, the cable from the shore, which is going up the orange pole there. And when you land the turbine, you're connected immediately. There's no secondary action. So again, anything in an offshore environment that requires subsea work, and obviously you have turbines that are floating and other forms of it, but for our turbine, you want to minimise your risk subsea and make it as quick as possible because time is money. Uh, the other, probably only other unique feature before I probably give Phil a chance is our turbine has a bearingless generator. Sounds strange, how can you have a bearingless generator? The entire generator is, is basically supported by the gearbox uh, bearing. So you've got less, less losses and uh, less wear. Phil, I'm sure I've missed a few things there that were probably not unique now, but unique at the time. Yeah, certainly. So maybe I'll just touch on a few of those. Um, um, we have a hydraulically actu actuated uh, yaw drive. Uh, this allows a turbine to spin from the ebb to the flood tide so we can get 100% of the power possible. Um, we also have a pitch system which um, reduces loads when we get above the rated power output. Um, that right now is electrically actuated, but previously it was hydraulically actuated. And the change was made to improve the um, reliability and the robustness of the system. Um, we've got a PMG, which is a permanent magnet generator. Um, the purpose of that, or the, the, the rationale for that, is that it's a very high efficiency type of generator. Um, we also have a two stage epicyclic gearbox, and that's got some flexible elements which improve the fatigue design of the, the um, item. Um, we choose to have our converters onshore. Uh, the reason for that is that the converters we see as one of the less reliable systems. It's much better to have something which may break onshore where we can get at it easily, uh, prevent unnecessary offshore operations. Um, the turbine sits on a gravity-based structure with ballast blocks. Um, it's not particularly um, unique nowadays, but back in the day when we were developing that, certainly it was. Um, and the whole system is designed to cope with um, some very high currents uh, and storm waves that we see in the, uh, the major end sites. Major Insight is one of the, has some of the strongest currents in the whole world. And this particular turbine is designed to, to survive a combination of a five meter per second flow and also 15 meter um, waves. Um, we can also operate in flows up to four and a half meters per second and waves up to about 5.4 meters. That's amazing. Uh, thanks for that detail. Um, just to remind anyone maybe not familiar with the system, how much power can this model produce? So, so this particular one's one and a half megawatts, isn't it, Phil? It is one and a half megawatts, yeah. Excellent. And I guess, uh, obviously, this is one of the, the 
first iterations, um, what's your you know trajectory been, and do you have a, a cost reduction trajectory to go with your um, build out design trajectory as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the headlines. Um, Phil probably touched on a few of them there. The, the three megawatt design is we've already designed a two megawatt version. Uh, the two megawatt version is actually um, not really a change at all to this because we, the, the load is, you know, like you start any engineering, it's over designed. So the two meg version was a pretty, in some respects, a, a, an easy step up. Um, but the detail, which I'll come to in a second, has changed inside the turbine to help that cost of energy. But we're now currently designing a three megawatt version for the Rasmus Shard project, which is partly under the Tiger, take Tiger regime. Um, and key to that is, you know, and most people have heard us say this before for subsea turbines in terms of the levelized cost of energy, there's a couple of um, major items which we've changed, which are adding a big step change to the price. One is the foundation, gravity based foundations, fantastic, pioneering, great stuff but they're not designed for volume. Um, they, they give you flexibility to, to do one-offs um, where you're not doing um, having to do major infrastructure work, but we moved to monopiles and then that process and the design of that is well underway. Um, once you get monopiles at volume over say 10 monopiles, your cost per unit comes down significantly to a gravity base. The biggest change, um, which is no different to wind, you know, we, again, we leverage off where, wherever we can off existing experience is maximizing rotor size and rating is uh, also critical to levelize cost of energy. And then probably the biggest step forward in terms of reducing balance of plant costs for us without going to putting conversion equipment sub C, which is obviously something to consider, is that we're now designing uh, for up to eight turbines of one uh, together to collectively go into a sub C hub. Uh, we've built a version of that sub C hub, a four into one version already and deployed it at Majin. Um, and that allows for eight turbines to generate through one export cable, significantly reducing balance of plant. So you've lost seven export cables and seven converters, and we're running that at a, at a partial fixed frequency regime. Anything I've missed there, Phil? Yeah, I think one of the things is just really economies of scale. So in previous iterations of a turbine, we've been installing one at a time. I think one of the ideas moving forwards is um, is looking at bigger scales. So if you're installing eight, 20, 100 turbines, uh, suddenly the, the, the numbers really do start to come down, not only on the actual cost of the components that go into the turbine, but also on the uh, offshore operations and, and doing the same same thing many times in a quick um, kind of period, uh, much better than just doing one-offs. So there's a big uh, reduction in cost of energy there. Another thing just to quickly touch on is um, the, the drivetrain is a modular design, which means that we can um, sub in and out components to change the rating of the turbine. And that then allows us to um, modify the, the turbine slightly in order to go into use it in different sites, so either deeper sites, uh, maybe slower flows, uh, but all about optimization. Brilliant. Um, we've got questions coming in from the audience. I'd like to try and feed some of those in. Um, first question from Rob Stevenson, and thanks Rob for uh, joining us and for your question. Um, how have the turbines performed at Maygen over the last two years? Uh, Rob, nice to, nice to hear your voice, Rob. Um, yeah, look, they've been they've been awesome to average, if I'm brutally honest. Um, but I always look at it in a positive light as though the first array in the world at that setup. Um, and we've now got turbines. So, for example, the Hammerfest turbine's just gone three years now, subsea without any intervention. That is huge for the tidal industry. We're not probably making enough noise about. Um, we've had some problems with our pitch, Rob. Um, never buy a hydraulic high pressure hydraulic rotating pitch if you're subsea turbine, uh, different maybe if you're floating uh, or a small unit. And that's been the main main issue for us. It's really hadn't been any major issues. Um, so, you know, Maygen's got two Hammerfest turbines on the beach now and ours are about to go back in um, and then they'll be back up at six megawatts. So I'd say, depending on your expectations as the world first array, Rob, um, I think we, uh, Give ourselves a pass mask, but obviously would have liked more than 40 gigawatt hours by now, but still 40 gigawatt hours. Yeah, okay. I think one more thing to add just quickly is um, the actual rotor efficiency. So um, our rotor efficiency is in incredibly high yeah. um, and exceeded actually our, our loading calculations by a little bit as well. So um, yeah, we're very happy with the way the turbine does perform when it's actually going. Okay, brilliant. Um, and Rob, very much appreciate your honesty, Drew. Um, just one short um Technology question, then we may need to move on um, from Sam Haskins. Uh, what is the minimum flow rate for the turbine and what's the power output at that level? 
Yeah, I can probably answer that. So um, we tend to cut in the AR-1500 around about 0.9 to 1 metres per second. Um, I think that gives us roughly around 50-ish kilowatts, but don't quote me on that number. Um, the turbine that we've got in Japan at the moment, um, that cuts in around about 0.7, 0.8 metres per second. Uh, and that literally starts at zero uh, just because of the design. And so at the start, it will just be rotating and the, the losses will equal the, the amount of um, torque going in. But um, yeah, slightly, slightly different onshore design for that particular turbine. OK, thanks very much, Phil. Um, I'm afraid we've got to move on. We will answer all the questions that are put forward, but uh, we need to now want to talk about sort of finance and economics. Lorna? Lorna, you're on, uh, you're on mute, Lorna. Sorry, I was coughing and I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Just saying, yeah, thank you for uh, walking us through that uh, technology. Um, and as Simon says, do keep your questions coming in. And if we can't answer them just now, we'll get them out, sent out by email afterwards. Um, so and what have been the main barriers that you've overcome as a business launching into the renewables over the years? Uh, where do I start? Um, yeah, look, the, the barriers is always is, is the same as the opportunities. Uh, first mover advantage is also a barrier in itself because you have you know, to invent stuff yourself. Um, so, you know, the barrier then ultimately everything comes down to money and, and funding that adventure and that pioneering um, requirement is, is a barrier. And, and, you know, we've made our way through that to date. Um, but, you know, the biggest barrier still is, you know, nobody goes into business just because money falls out of the sky and engineers love to play with toys. It's we need to make um, make this a viable industry. And we need to, um, you know, we need to contribute to the to the energy mix, um, be that uh, direct to grid or or other commodity options. And the barrier to that is obviously getting volume in the water and the incentives around the world are staying the obvious, the incentives around the world to be able to fund that. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, how, how's the the company funded, and what are the sort of investment opportunities in Atlantis? Yeah, you've jumped, you've jumped us, you've jumped a spot in our agenda, and I'm completely thrown off now by where we are. <laughs> that was the idea, Drew. This life. <laughs> Just to keep me on my toes. Um, yeah, I mean, we're funded historically by a smallish band of shareholders. You know, without you know the, the friends and families to start these businesses off, you you don't get anywhere. And we've we've done that very well. Um, the, the business has been very good at raising money when it needs it. Um, more recently, we floated, as you know, on the AIM, um, and that was uh, that's given us the, the opportunity to diversify the business uh, into non uh, to anything that's renewable and, and fits our overall mandate. Hence, uh, the Usman's power station um, revenue. We still need. You know, gone are the days where the shareholders were going to give me twenty million and then fill off you go and just spend twenty million on R and D. Those days are long gone. We need to self fund. So the Japan project allows us to do that, allows us to take new technology, didn't make much money out of it, but certainly got our foot in the door of a new market. We're able to put a, a component in the water down there that's still running at over 95, 96% availability. Um, and that's given us revenue to keep funding more. So it's a self-funding position now. And if we can't find the revenue, there's a lot more pressure on, on us to, to, to not be spending the money. Um, grants still help. You know, we, we can't base a business on only relying on grants um, but uh, and we certainly don't do that but they are they are very helpful we've used them over the years and I think they're particularly in Europe now with the uh, and the UK with the AR4 there is a push to see marine get where it should go and there are more grant money opportunities around so we'll certainly be looking at those um, and we make a little bit of coin on consultancy here and there but but most of it's from those those are revenue streams yeah, brilliant. Um, and so, you know, good news for Tidal. Um, a couple of weeks ago with the CFD announcement and the 20 million ring fence, you know, just talk to us a little bit about what difference that makes for CIMAC Atlantis and your sort of forward plans. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's huge. It's a great relief to the industry. I mean, it was, it was a close call. Um, it, and it uh, allows us now much the same as you did with Major One to say, okay, there is a project now, there's the next X megawatt of turbines. 
Um, and again, we're a developer as well as a technologist to say, okay, with the developers have on, we want to see revenue to our shareholders through development of technology, for deployment of technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be the AR uh, 1500 or whatever AR we put in. Um, but we now have at least a budget to aim for there and can able put our developers out back on now and say, okay, what are we going to do with that site beyond major in phase one? Uh, and how do, we, uh, how do we then execute that? And there's a time frame now, there's a window of time. I think that's the important part. We all, once we get our heads around all the rules and regulations for this AR4, there is a set window there that we're going to have to comply to. And that's great for the industry as well. It means that we have to put turbines in the water or do something with that AR4 by a certain date, whatever it is, 2025, 26. Yeah, and and we, we we sort of mentioned the Tiger project at the outset of the of the discussion, um, and Tiger is about working with other um, technology developers. Um, you know, good news for the UK with a with a with a CFD for Tidal Stream. Do, do you think that that's going to sort of ripple across Europe and other um, technology developers? And do you see see yourself sort of you know collaborating with those developers in the future? Oh, absolutely. I think. Um... I think, to be brutally frank, Europe, Europe had taken a step ahead of the UK. Um, you know, one gigawatt by 2030 is at least a mandate. The feed-in tariff's not necessarily there yet, so you know, the AR4s allowed the UK to, to, to take that step up. But in terms of collaboration, which I think is the key to all this, is, as I said earlier, um, you know, we've done all this different development over the years. We've built 10 different turbines, believe it or not, probably more than anyone else of different ilks from 200 blades to two blades over the last 20 years. Um, nobody wants to repeat that cycle. And in fact, when you look, and I was just at the conference OEE in uh, Brussels, we talked to the other developers. We're all doing, which is good to see, a mean reversion of what we're doing. We're all in the same space. So collaborating now and actually not wasting the same, uh, different pockets of money doing the same thing is absolutely key. Um, and I think the biggest, optimistic, and I'm always an optimist in this industry, but one of the biggest optimistic markers, if you like, um, for, for current times is that when I went to conferences 15 years ago, there were 20 different wacky machines flying about uh, and nobody was really overly helping each other. I think nowadays people have cottoned on to the fact that, you know, we're an industry, we want to make an industry and what we need is, you know, the, the theme for the European um, conference was 100 megawatts in the water by 2025. Um, and I think that's, on its own already, already creating a collaborative spirit. Brilliant. Excellent. And in terms of where the company's heading, obviously we're talking a lot about these plans and ambitions and things you've talked about. You've got a mix of technologies and sites all over the world. You've already mentioned Japan and Manuel's and the, the questions here keen to hear more about your Japan project and your work with Nova in Indonesia. And uh, Richard here is also asking about his there are sitting next phase of Meijin um, coming up as well. So, so what's your, your plans and ambitions for the future yourselves? That was a whole lot of questions at once. But um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to sum up, get, get a capsulation of them all as quickly as uh, possible. It's, it's really simple. We've, we've got to continue to bring down the cost of energy, our turbines, and get, uh, get our systems in the water to, to volume. And we'll do that through collaboration with uh, developers around the world, which is what we did in Japan. Um, and uh, We've also got to encourage as much as we can that, uh, that the UK now gets that next 50 megawatts in the water. Um, so our plans are really about increasing again our revenue stream on the, on the project development side of the business and also getting that last 10% of technology development finished. There's, there's, there's always something to do there. And there's always an R&D partner that wants to spend some money. Um, but yeah, in a, in a nutshell, it's now getting volume in the water is the best way to encapsulate our plans. I think from my point of view, I think there's a bit of a, a political will around the world for you know, renewable energy, especially ocean renewables. Um, people can see that there's a great potential there and they, they really think it should be tapped into. I think Japan's a great example of this where the, the government are, are really keen on renewable energy. Um, they don't have a great wind resource, um, so they're looking into tidal. Uh, and there's great political will um, as well as um, kind of drive from the developer that we partner with in Japan um, to make that a reality. Um, I think um, Japan was a real challenge because we delivered it during coronavirus, very tight timescales, very tight budget, uh, but we've managed to make a great success out of it. And I think Drew missold it a bit earlier. It's actually 97% avail availability for this year for the turbine. So it was a great achievement. And that is hopefully uh, spawning now the next phase where we go to a more commercial style turbine uh, rather, rather than a pilot. 
Okay, thanks very much, Philip. Some great facts and figures in, in that session. Um, unfortunately, we're coming to the close of today's event. Um, we've covered the technology uh, and how tidal power can contribute to net zero in the UK. Um, but I'd like to go back to a point that I made uh, right at the start. Um, Simec Atlantis um, is a really good example of how something that's good for the planet in terms of tidal power can also be good for the economy, um, particularly the benefits for regions where you work. Um, so what do policymakers need to know about the benefits of um, tidal power and what it brings? Yeah, I mean, I think we don't sell enough to policymakers the predictability of tidal. Um, and also what that does in terms of grid services, what the, the advantages are of the grid. Um, so that, that for, for sure, we need to do a better job of selling. Um, and also it's adaptability to, to other green commodities, such as hydrogen. I think there's a great opportunity there going forward. Um, yeah, opportunities around industry development, job creation, all that as well. But um, Phil, what have I missed, mate? Yeah, I think uh, I think the last one, just to, to expand on that a little bit, I think it's a great opportunity, especially for the UK government uh, and Europe as well, um, to, you know, to really develop this industry, create jobs for it. Um, we're in the infancy right now, and hopefully we go as big as the wind. Um, so there's a great opportunity there for governments to kind of back and increase their economy. Um, and Japan certainly sees that as a big positive of helping to develop tidal power is also building an industry. Um, certainly, uh, safe, uh, I think the safety of the turbine as well. So... Um, there's been studies which are ongoing uh, regarding uh, marine life, uh, fishes, um, and water quality. Uh, and all, all, at the moment, all, all I've heard is positive news about tidal turbines. So, um, so very low impacts on the environment. Another great thing about tidal, I think, which they really touch on in Japan, is that you can't see it. It's just it's below the surface. We're not in, we're not impacting on people's visuals. Uh, this makes a massive difference actually in Japan, where they don't want to see wind turbines. They've got a really beautiful island landscape, uh, and so putting the turbine subsea out of sight, out of mind, it's just generating power. Excellent, thank you very much, Drew and Philip for joining us today and taking us through your company's fascinating story. My pleasure. Yeah, I'd just like to say, I'd like to say thanks to the audience as well for joining. Um, it's great to see so many people enthusiastic about tidal power. And uh, yeah, we, uh, I think as engineers working on tidal, um, we feel kind of a responsibility to make this happen for everyone. You know, this is hopefully a great news story for the whole world. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks very much, Drew. And thanks for me as well for a, a really interesting session. It's been great. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers, now. So um, just remember uh, to tune in at the same time next week when we're using the same link to provide you, which has been provided to you if you've, if you've registered. Um, the Tidal Power Express wraps up next Wednesday. Uh, with a final lunchtime session where our Director of Research and Disruptive Innovation, Dr. Stephen Wyatt, is leading a debate on the future of tidal power in the UK and the policy support needed to ensure it's reach, it, it reaches its potential. Um, Steve Wyatt will be joined by Sue Barr, Chair of the uh, Marine Energy Council, and uh, from EMEC, Elaine Linkletter. Um, Drew will be back from CIMAC Atlantis, and he'll be joined by John Meager, um, who's Business Development Manager at Nova Innovation. Um, thank you very much indeed. So get your questions ready um, for that next session next week, and uh, we'll see you then. Um, and you can also find more um, about CIMAC Atlantis on the Tidal Power Express Hub or at cimacatlantis.com. And then finally, to say any questions that have been raised that we haven't had a chance to answer, um, we will be providing answers out to all those that have re registered for this event. So thank you very much indeed.